Well, morning, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name's Fraser Batty. I'm from the Strategy Unit. Um, and welcome to the Insight 2020 Festival. It's a festival of research and analysis and looking at the role of the use of intelligence in uh, decision making. Okay. It's being run by the Strategy Unit, but we're doing it as part of the launch of a major new initiative in the Midlands uh, to launch the decision support units, uh, which, are, which are all about gathering good local intelligence and feeding that into decision making. The festival itself, I think is five weeks long. Um, and this week has focused on inequality. That's been our topic. We've had sessions on inequality in gender, on health and homelessness, on young people and mental health and the role of the arts uh, in that, and also on ethnicity and inequality. The panel session today, we're going to touch on some of those topics. I have absolutely no doubt we're going to add uh, a whole host more. Before we go on to introduce any panel members or talk more about it, I just wanted to cover uh, a little bit of housekeeping. So please, during the session, keep your microphone on mute so that we maximise what we can hear from our panel and minimise uh, domestic, domestic noise from, from people attending. And please introduce yourselves in the chat box. We'd love to know uh, who's come today. We'd love to know your name, you know, where you're from, your job title, that kind of thing. Please also, throughout the session, use the chat box to give us questions, which I'm going to uh, gather together and I'll, I'll put the panel in, in various different ways. Also use the chat box to raise technical issues. Please don't shout at me, I won't be able to help. And um, note, please also that sessions are recorded and that we're gonna send the links around to everyone who's registered afterwards. And uh, Fazana, this is particularly for you, maybe me and any other Twitter addicts uh, that we have joining us today. Uh, our hashtag is Insight 2020 and our the Stress Unit account is at strategy underscore unit. So please, uh, please tweet away. Um, the session today then is themed on inequality. Um, my take on it is that, is that inequality is actually a defining feature of UK society and that relative to the recent past in this country and also relative to countries that we would want to compare ourselves to. We are an unequal uh, society and we're a divided society. Um, it's, this is not news, I don't think. This is a sort of long established story and, and the story of inequality in health is, is very well known. But again, to my mind, things have actually got uh, worse recently. We've seen stalled gains in life expectancy. And in fact, we've seen reductions in expected uh, in, in life expectancy, particularly for uh, poorer women which to my mind is, is an astonishing and a shocking uh, story for a country like ours. So I think things have got worse. I also think, think things have got more complex. When we considered inequality in the past, my sense is that the, our, our lens on it was a class lens, that we would look at class inequality. And now we do that, but we also introduce inequalities of ethnicity, of gender, of age, of sexuality, of disability, and also, of course, then the intersections between those different understandings of inequality. So it's, got a, it's become a, a, an a, a apparently more complex problem in the way that we look at it. I also don't think we can ignore the effect of COVID. COVID has blown through that picture and has revealed some, uh, some horror, some really stark inequalities. And again, my sense on this, countries that have coped best with the pandemic are egalitarian countries, are more communitarian minded, have got a stronger sense of common good and of common purpose. And conversely, countries that have done badly, individualistic, low trust, unequal societies. And I'm afraid that's how I would uh, characterize our society. And I mean, every, every decent analysis done of health inequalities has shown us, you know, it's the wider determinants that cause uh, health inequality in very large measure. So it's inequalities in employment and employment quality, housing and housing quality in the environment, in education and community relations, those kinds of things. And yet the NHS has a role to play. We know the NHS has got a big role to play in this. It's the provider of services. It's always a big local employer and particularly in deprived areas, it's a provider of good high quality local employment. And increasingly in current policy, it's seen as a shaper of place with its colleagues in the in the local authority. So that's what we're going to focus in on today. We're going to look at inequality, but we're going to we're going to focus in on the, the NHS's role. We've got an amazing panel 
to discuss that topic today. I mean, just a really brilliant panel, and it's a, it's a complete privilege to bring uh, this group of people together to discuss that topic. I'm not going to introduce uh, them. I'm going to ask each of them in turn to say just a little bit about uh, themselves as they as they introduce uh, their take on the topic. I've, <laughs> we've given them homework. We've given them a question to focus in on to make sure that we, we keep this topic as focused as we can. The question we've given them is if you could wave a wand, if you could wave a magic wand and change the way that the NHS works, what changes would you make in order to reduce inequality? So it's both, it's both a magical question, um, but also on one level quite a practical and, and quite a focused question. I'm going to ask each of them to address it in turn and just, just take five minutes uh, as, they, as they do so. So we'll spend about the first half hour just hearing from, from each panellist in turn and their take on it. I'm then going to open it for each of the panellists just to respond to each other. I know from their previous work and from involvement with many of them that there's commonality in the ways that they will take uh, this topic, but also divergence. So I'm going to ask them to, to talk to one another and I'm also going to introduce questions from uh, the chat box. So that's the way we're going to, that's the way we're going to run it. Um, I'll, I mean, I'll kind of keep time. So if, if, if you're speaking and you see me starting to gesture at you, that will be me attempting to signal that you're, you're either there or, or nearly there. Um, but, but I won't be too strict, I promise. Um, I want to ask, uh, first of all, Fazana, if, if you could kick us off, if we could have five minutes from you uh, on, on that question, and then we'll, I'll invite the next person to speak. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President. And good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for having me, for joining us. Um, so I'm Susanna Hussain. Um, uh, I'm a GP um, and I work in Newham in East London. Um, and uh, sadly, we are famous for having the highest COVID death rates in the country. Um, I run a practice of 5,000 patients. Um, and apart from being a GP, um, I'm also a clinical director for one of our 10 primary care networks. Um, and I'm very interested in primary care networks and I, I think it does go a little way into trying addressing these health inequalities and, um, and I'm delighted to be representing primary care networks nationally as part of my uh, one of my new roles as co-chair of the primary care network at NHS Confederation. Um, and um, I, I tried to do my homework, I tried to be a, 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 a good spot and um, I, um, I, I found this question hard and, and I think that's a good thing uh, because for me health inequalities is so wide uh, as Fraser you've described and um, I think that particularly with COVID having shone a light on how many health inequalities we have and this is important but you know I'm a GP and I think about I love to talk about things, but actually what can we do to deliver change? Um, and that's my passion. How can we make a difference? Um, so when um, I was looking at, you know, Marmot 2020, and as you say, it says that, you know, the life expectancy of women has actually decreased in the, the last 10 years. And um, also that um, some self-reported um, scores that um, women and their sort of active quality of life, they feel that that's, you know, gone at as young as 55. You know, being a 47 year old woman, that scared the life out of me. And I think that, you know, these are avoidable. And I think that's the thing that's really important for me to remember that these health inequalities are avoidable. This morning being a Twitter addict, I could see that, you know, one in three children are living in poverty in Newham in East London. We've got more children who are in temporary housing than in the whole of the Northwest. Uh, and you know, these are, are shocking, but what can I do? What can we do about that instead of just moaning about it? Well, I think that there's some great work happening. I think that uh, in terms of the um, BAME, and again, remembering that BAME is not one homogenous group, but I'm really pleased to see that, you know, there's now a race and health observatory to actually think about that. And particularly in primary care, <clears throat> have we been looking at who are the people that are suffering from health inequalities? So up until now, Fraser, we haven't actually been coding ethnicities um, that well in primary care. So one of the, 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 the new initiatives for us um, through NHS England is in primary care to do that. So, so I think that's, you know, a small but really significant thing because we can't talk about inequalities if we don't know what they are. So that's important. 
Um, I think on a wider perspective, I think that um, this is a, a society problem for me. It, it's not just a health problem. And one of the reasons I wanted to come out of my practice is after 15, 16 years of being a GP in a consulting room, I could find that I wasn't able to give my patients what they wanted. So I, I couldn't help my mum who had three kids with asthma, who's actually living in really damp housing, who hasn't got a job. Um, and, and all I can do is give her a few antidepressants. So from a very human granular level, whatever we were doing just wasn't working. I really like the idea of primary care networks. And I know we've got a, a little way to go. I do understand that it's a real transformation. But looking at the work of the NAPC, the National Association of Primary Care and their primary care home model, I love that integration. I love the fact that actually for the first time, certainly in my career as a GP, we have got a connection with voluntary sector with our communities to be able to join up you know, with our hospitals, with our mental health trust. Um, so I think that I have never been more excited about the fact that we want to tackle health inequalities. If I had a magic wand, I would number one, um, put it into different categories. So housing, some of the things you mentioned, housing, education, all of this matters. Think about preventative care. I mean, one of my bugbears about um, you know, always moaning about the NHS is that we do great stuff in a reactive fashion. So we do great stuff when you're already in hospital. Um, in London, thanks to um, James Kingsland, who I know from um, NAPC, we're trying to get a violence reduction program for our young people. Um, I had a 15 year old who made the national who was stabbed to death this time last year. I'm very happy to talk about heart failure and frailty, but our kids are dying. 15 year olds are dying. What society are we in when my two kids are 16 and 17 and one of my patients is already dead? That shouldn't be happening. And we need to think about how we prevent that. So in this, um, we're, we're really pleased in London that we've got the ear of the, the mayor. And what I'm looking at is not looking at the children who have already had an event of stabbing and in hospital. I want to look at the 10 year olds today so that we can stop that in five years time. So my second point would be to really think about how we prevent that and that's wider than health. Um, but but um, I think we are a, a little bit there, certainly um, you mentioned the NHS as, an, as, as an, um, more than just healthcare. And again, I'm fortunate to work in London. Um, I, I met the lovely uh, Michael Wood, who works I think in NHS England and Confederation, thinking about NHS as an anchor, as an employer. In Newham, we've had the highest furlough rate uh, in the whole of the London boroughs. We know these people are going to be unemployed. I want to stop some of those suicides that I know is going to happen in the next few years because that's not going to make me feel any better and absolutely cuts to the core of my job as a GP. So I, th I think we're making really good progress. Uh, I'd like to see more action uh, and I think that should start at local level. So we're really pleased that we've got health inequalities days coming out, but actually we need to start at local level. Great to register people with the GP, great to give flu jabs, but health inequality is not all about flu jabs. So let's start local, let's work with our communities because nobody wants to know that they live in a society where one in three children are starving. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, just, well, thank, I mean, thank you for the content. Thank you for five minutes on the nose. That was incredible. Um, the, already, I mean, just from having worked with some of you, I can hear a lot of what you were saying, particularly in relation to the NHS as an employer, as an anchor institution, is going to resonate with Paul and, and with Lucy in the Black Country as well. So already I'm hearing uh, common themes coming out, perhaps knowing what perhaps Paul and Lucy might touch on. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you ever so much, uh, Fazana. Can I can I hand your wand over to Chris? Chris, could you do if you could do five? I think we could really hand this wand. Chris, if you could um, if you could do five minutes on the on the same question, please. Mute. That to be one of us. Um, thanks very much. Um, yeah, um, Chris Bentley. Um, I suppose uh, some people will have known me through the, uh, the role of head of the Health Inequalities National Support Team, which I did in the late 2000s. Um, and uh, since then, I've been trying to take the huge amount of learning that we got from that 
um, working for four or five years, working with the 70 most deprived areas with the poorest health across the country, looking at the, the good practice, but then looking at the barriers and the gaps that were there and what might be done about those. Um, as that uh, initiative uh, came to an end, uh, what I've been trying to do is sort of make sure that the baton's handed on and some of that learning is actually translated across the different changes that we've seen in health and, and uh, the systems uh, um, uh, as, as we change. The national target um, consisted of a, a, a goal to actually reduce the mortality uh, uh, level and the increase the life expectancy between the most deprived to 20% of local authorities and the national average. And this was a, a, a really useful thing. There was a, a, for each local area, there was a target part of the, a, a share of that target. Um, and so everybody knew what they were after and what they were working towards and could share their experience about how they were getting there or not. Um, and um, they were able to adapt their approaches uh, and cir to circumstances locally. But at the same time, they were all being measured against a particular outcome uh, as well, so that we could see how, how well that was going. It was important right at the beginning to appreciate the NHS couldn't do that alone. And so it was important to support strong partnerships. And there were even uh, audit office going around local authorities, making sure that each partnership was effective and working to uh, in efficient sort of ways. Um, <clears throat> we still need those strong partnerships, of course. And uh, what I've tried to do is bring some of the learning there so that practice-based approaches that PHE launched uh, last year um, has got a triangle, which has got three components, civic, uh, community, and integrated services. And each of those segments on their own can make a percentage difference of population level, but how much better is it if we can do it all together and echoing what uh, we've just heard from the previous speaker. Um, disadvantage is full of crises in the places that we're on. It's all about crisis. Um, crisis in income and debt, in housing, in jobs, um, crime, and even food these days. Um, and they all may take precedence before healthcare. Um, <clears throat> now, without the national goal, um, I'm afraid that the systems are much more patchy and variable than they were at that time. Now, system, um, system first, means uh, working down from STP ICS through place and into primary care networks and integrated neighborhoods. Um, and my wish would be that each of those sorts itself out with a unique selling point for each level, but working in concert, that's not the case at the moment and uh, everywhere, some places do it well, but it's not everywhere. And working in concert, but also that they clearly sort out how partnership works at each of those levels. Um, consistently well at each level um, to fit function as a coherent or whole. And I'm worried about place level with CCGs are moving out from there. Who is the connectivity from the NHS into local authority and what remains of health and wellbeing boards? The second thing I'm talking here about uh, the, what we worked out in the national support team uh, was this little uh, uh, triptych about system scale and sustainability. So that was system. What I'm gonna be talking about here is system scale and sensitivity, because I think that's more important at the moment. Scale, little projects won't do it. And that was our understanding and our learning right through. How can we model dimensions of change to shift a population level problem? Um, we're not talking about Stalinist scale with a million tractors all the same, but we're talking of a kind of small is beautiful um, kind of, uh, of thing. I used to describe a quilt made up of squares of different colours and textures um, representing uh, a, a local population. And for each of those squares, there needed to be an answer to all of our key questions, our components of priority. There needed to be an answer that was actually adapted and adopted uh, according to the, con the conditions in that particular area. And system could enable this to happen, shared learning, uh, resource distribution appropriately and joining up the scale where that's appropriate could really make that continue to happen, which is important. And finally, uh, I, I've talked about sensitivity rather than sustainability. Um, where are the missing thousands from our proactive care? Um, we used to talk about the missing thousands before, it's still there. Um, connectivity is not just about digital algorithms, AI, it's got its place, 
Um, but my experience recently is, for example, surrounded by older people, um, they think that the NHS has gone away, a lot of them. How sad is that? And for certain cultural groups locally, they even think it's hostile. How terrible is that? How can we work in those sort of environments? And place-based approaches can actively support engagement where and how people live. That's the critical thing. And the public sector and voluntary community and faith areas have got their huge role to play in that together with the NHS, which is often a missing partner we've seen in local areas. Uh, it likes to do things itself rather than actually connecting so well. Um, what we need is, a, is an approach which welcomes, which brings advocacy and support, which can make a health contact easy contact, and it can bridge uh, the sort of perceived no man's land that I described that might get right in the way. That's my pitch. System scale sensitivity in my three visions. Thank you. That's excellent. I also heard um, focus and I also had a very strong uh, uh, a theme of partnership working and of, of the NHS reaching out and playing its, its role as a, as a partner. Thank you, Chris. That was fantastic. Also on time as well. I'm just trying to create some pressure for subsequent speakers <laughs> to, uh, to to also behave in the same in the same sort of way. Uh, and just a reminder for, for people to put questions uh, into the chat box so I can um, pick out some questions to our speakers as, as well as asking them to ask questions of each other. Chris, could you hand over your wand, please, to Paul? Um, and Paul, if you could give us give us uh, introduce yourself and then and then give us your five minute take on the question. Uh, thanks, Fraser. So my name's um, Paul Movak. I'm the um, uh, chief exec for the uh, CCGs across the Black Country in West Birmingham and also the senior responsible officer for the STP. Um, so I'm going to start with a kind of system perspective, which is that if I look at the um, if I look at the big health inequality issues uh, or, or some of the big health inequality issues for our system, the first one it starts with is life expectancy. And I think one of the biggest gaps, one of the biggest inequalities is the, f is the fact that for people living with severe and during mental illness, their life expectancy on average in our system is 15 years shorter than those without. I mean, that's a staggering gap in inequality. And then if you, um, then if you look at, um, we're also kind of serving a kind of post-industrial, you know, post-manufacturing community, which is a lot high levels of deprivation and, the second biggest inequality is that of healthy life expectancy. So we have substantially below average levels of healthy life expectancy, and that is deteriorating um, every year um, at the moment. So um, if we think about, well, what are the biggest, mark, biggest predictors or the biggest indicators for those two issues? Actually, they do coalesce together at one point. Um, so with regards to, to healthy life expectancy, the biggest indicators for that start with, do you get a qualifications coming out of school? Are, are you obese as a child? Um, are you ready for, you know, what's the level of school readiness before you even start school? So it starts in early childhood. And if we think about mental health, um, half of all mental health disorders emerge before you're 14 years old. And one in, um, one in 10 children have a clinically diagnosed mental disorder at some point in their childhood. So if we wanna think about the issues around, um, actually, how do we address the, these, uh, but obviously there are factors in adulthood as well, but if we want to really get to grips with these inequalities, then I think it actually starts with the first few years of life. Um, and so if I had a blank sheet, yeah, that was a question, I think, a blank sheet of paper. I think one of the first thing that I do if I'm, is I de defer to the Faculty of Public Health because they they what they say is that the most important mar modifiable risk factor in childhood and therefore in adult life in general is your home circumstancing and the quality of pairing and home life that you have as a child. So if we want to really address the inequalities in health, I think it has to start with that. So personally, I'd be looking at how do we provide far more um, quality of support for the kind of patient child you know relationship in the home um, how do we support proper infant and child nutrition nutrition um, how do we support healthy lifestyle behaviors in families and I think that means us giving preferential treatment to targeting parents who are suffering for example from substance misuse or alcohol misuse or other health um, health 
working conditions and you know and how do we support kind of parents dealing with and families dealing with behavioral management and early signs of kind of mental illness um last um, last year i was talking to school some school nurses in our patch asking them about their experiences and um they they advised me that the single biggest issue that they deal with with children are mental health related issues so i think then the kind of the second agenda that i'd be i'd want to see is a, a substantial investment really in how we support schools to create healthy environments but again both from a nutrition point of view um also in terms of healthy behaviors but also supporting mental particularly supporting mental well-being in children um i've got another minute i think so in addition to kind of that emphasis on childhood i will just pick up then in terms of one of the things that covid has taught us i think is there are the significant issues around the equality because I think I think health inequality and the equality agenda are inter massively interconnected, and um, so I will pick up the point. I think there are two two strands to look at with this. Both, first of all, the point about us as an employer, you know, the, the health service is a major employer, and another key factor in terms of people's long term healthy life expectancy is whether or not you have a decent job. So I think we have a significant role. In to, as employers in terms of ensuring that we fundamentally ensure that we address the issues of equality in our employment of people from our local community. Um, and that's all kind of measures of equality, whether that be BAME, whether that be gender equality, et cetera. Um, and, um, and then secondly, in terms of how we address equality with the population, in terms of how we provide equitable access to services, I think one of the things I've just, and I'm going to go over the five minutes, sorry, Fraser said, I always do this, I know. Um, one of the things that I has really kind of, I really learned in the last year is the work that we've done with our LD clients in the Black Country in West Birmingham. Um, and, and, and the whole process of trying to particularly bring people out of inpatient care into the community. And the thing that's really enabled us to deliver on that is a, uh, huge focus on ensuring we're getting the personalization of this right and we're really understanding the needs of the individual so i think another aspect of this is is making the nhs more personal to people and, and gearing the nhs so that actually we're geared towards the needs of the uh, the personal needs of the individual and how we frame the way we work around them rather than expecting them to fit into the way we work that's lovely. I'm beginning to think I've overplayed this five minutes business. You were, you were exhibiting anxiety well inside your five very minutes slide. <laughs> um, thank you, Paul. That was that, that was great. I, I mean, really, again, really strong themes. You know, the NHS as an employer, Fazana spoke about that. She also spoke about um, mental health, children, young people, and you've extended that into support, early support for families and the, and the sort of family environment and, and the early years uh, environment. So fantastic points. Also that point about, you know, treating people as people with will, with volition, with goals, with assets, rather than as passive objects of intervention, which I would say the NHS is, is, is often too guilty of, of thinking about people in, in that sort of way. Um, so the, the, the one that hasn't got far to travel now, it's going across the black country to uh, Lucy Heath. So Lucy, if you could, if you could introduce yourself and then give us your five minute take on the topic. Again, I'll just encourage people to put questions in the in the chat box as, as Lucy speaks. Yep. Hi, hi Fraser. So I'm Lucy Heath. I'm a Academy Director for the Black Country in West Birmingham, SDP. Um, my background is public health. I've worked in public health and system improvement for the, the last 10 years um, and in the NHS for all my career, pretty much. Um, so yeah, so if I had, a, if I could wave a wand and change the way the NHS works, the first thing I wanted to do was do something about our data. So I would like all our data to be connected. Um, and I think that better data, particularly around um, groups that face deprivation or our socially excluded groups is really important. I think at the moment, we know inequalities exist, but we make a lot of assumptions about exactly where and how those equalities, where they are, which groups they're, affecting and how they affect those groups. I think we make a lot of assumptions around that and we're making decisions um, not based on intelligence. So my first thing would be to really connect the, all our data to improve that. But data only goes, takes you so far, you need to in, turn that into intelligence. So I think we'd also need to invest a lot more in our analytical capacity so that we can use that connected data to explore inequalities that currently exist and the impact that changes that we may have on those inequalities. 
And part of that, I think, is about really enhancing the profile as analysts, as equal partners to clinicians and policymakers in discussions about what we change um, and making sure that thinking about our data and the intelligence we've got on inequalities is embedded in all our work streams. I think at the moment we start looking at health inequalities and people think maybe we set up a health inequalities group, but we won't be able to do it in a silo like that. This needs to be embedded in our cancer programme, in our mental health programme, in our primary care programme. Um, so really kind of getting that right would be my first thing. So I was picking up on what um, Fazana said about that, that we can't talk about health inequalities if we don't know what they are. So the first thing would be about improving things so we really know what our health inequalities are. Um, my second bit would be about investment. Um, I think we get a lot of kind of targets of things that we need to do as systems, um, but actually I don't think there's sufficient recognition from the centre that actually if you want to do those effectively in every system, then some systems have more needs than others. Um, so my next bit would be about investing our NHS resources disproportionately so that actually more resources go to the places where there are the highest inequalities because actually you need to invest a lot to address inequalities to target specific groups we need to things do, do things differently and it might not be the most cost effective intervention but if we want to address inequalities we need we need the funding to be able to do that um, so yeah so something around investing our NHS resources disproportionately across England and then my, my third bit and I think uh, Chris touched on this with his pyramid, but instead of a pyramid, I've got a Venn diagram of four bubbles overlapping, um, which an integrated health and care system is part of, but actually improving our population health and addressing inequalities, that will only take us so far. Um, the evidence suggests it's about 20% of the impact. Um, and the other bubbles are about the wider determinants of health, our health behaviours and lifestyles, and the place and communities that we live in and with. Um, so I think, my, if I could wave a magic wand, everybody in the NHS would know that, that actually the clinical services and the access and quality of those services only takes us so far. And actually we need to focus on the other three bubbles and the interaction between them as well. Um, and then therefore that we have a greater focus on what the NHS can do to support those other three pillars. And I think um, the other speakers have talked about this. So things like anchor institutions. So um, what can the NHS do to make sure our local population have the opportunity to be employed in the NHS, that there's those entry jobs and career development that people can engage with, which both gives good employment, income, but also hope um, that people can um, progress to that kind of employment. Um, I think a lot more focus on behaviours and lifestyle. Um, we spend a lot of money on kind of medication and things, but we don't invest as much in kind of talking to people about their behaviours and lifestyle. So if I had a magic wand, we'd be investing a lot more in our behaviours and lifestyle. Um, and then also about supporting community ca capacity and, and social action. I think to a certain extent, the NHS has kind of dis dispowered people that actually people turn to the NHS really early on and think that we can solve the problems. And if we aren't there, that that's really difficult for them but actually we could do a lot more to kind of support that community capacity and support people to take social action to do things that would um, improve their own health um, and picking up on Paul's point about the early years we know that all these things are cumulative in their effect so the earlier that we can start on addressing all those things um, the better um, yeah so so my last bit was um, just about kind of what we might look like if we were doing this really well. So we'd have the, we'd be focusing on populations and particular segments of our populations who've got the, the greatest need, who are facing the greatest inequalities, and we'd be able to invest our resources to support them. We'd really have good systems of intelligence that would allow us to do that population health improvement um, really effectively across partnerships. As a partnership, we'd have that collective view of resource use that we'd be able to work together to invest it in the right places, that actually, if there's a child suffering from asthma, we can think about the resources that that, that that child needs, not just from the NHS perspective, but from the whole system's perspective, that actually doing something about um, their, the warmth of their house or the dampness of their house might, might be much more effective than providing more inhalers or doing non-elective admissions for um, asthma exacerbation. Um, that we'd have many more analysts kind of embedded um, in our decision making so that we're actually much more intelligence driven and that we're making decisions based on intelligence. 
and that we'd be focusing on the things that are really valuable, like wider determinants of health, like supporting our communities develop and like our lifestyles and behaviour. And we'd be working things out with our populations. We co-produce that with our populations because they're the ones that really understand um, what they need. I haven't been keeping an eye on time at all, days of that. <laughs> no, you've done, no, you've done a glorious job, uh, Lucy. Thank you ever so much. I mean, look, there's a whole load in there that, of course, is going to be uh, music to several ears in the audience. And, and hearing this with a strategy unit, a uh, pair of ears on, um, the, you know, the role of data, of analysts, of intelligence, uh, be, you know, better all of that and putting uh, analysts more alongside decision makers as they make uh, investment decisions. Of course, you know, brilliant, love, love, great to hear. Um, you did touch on a slightly controversial topic, although you skated over it slightly and, and maybe someone will bring you back to it. But you, you were saying um, you would invest, even if, it, even if it meant less health gain overall, if you could achieve greater levels of inequality, you would go for that. Now, I think that's the topic that we might want to we want to return to because I think that's a. It's Sorry, I didn't mean to skate over it, Fraser. I was trying no, to say I'm, clearly. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm teasing you. Were, you were crystal clear. Um, you, you did end with a series of points that I know Muir is uh, would have resonated very, very strongly with Muir in terms of having a population view, having a sense of collective resources and the distribution of those uh, resources amongst population groups. Um, so, so can I hand over Muir? I think you're in Oxford. So can we? Can the magic wand travel from the black country? I don't know, down the M40 or something to, to Muir. And if you, Muir, if you could do your five minutes on that question, and then I'm going to invite you all to, to comment on what each other has, has said. So Muir, could you do your five minutes for us, please? Well, I wave my wand and uh, I'm actually going to find people a day's pay if they confuse inequality with inequity. And I'm not sure if you discussed inequity earlier this week, but just for clarification, if I could just you let me share the screen, I'll put a, a definition up. So uh, I was once at a BMA meeting, and we're going to set up in London a BMA committee about poverty. And I said, well, um, is uh, our doctor's salaries on the agenda? Because there's no biological reason why my salary is 10 times the old age pension. Oh, no, no, that's, uh, no, that's not on the agenda. It's, uh, poverty is a bad thing. Um, but I said, well, we're, we're part of, and I belong to the BMA for you to keep my salary up. So I'm part of it. But um, the key issue, I think, is, is inequity. And I just, this is from our, hang on, this is from our glossary. Can you see that? Wait till I am. Um, yeah, make it a wee bit bigger. Yep, hang on. Oh, damn, where's it gone? This is from Thomas Rice. And um, so, um, so there's quotes here from, uh, and th this is all available free, which uh, uh, this is the, the Triple Value Healthcare. I'm a consultant in public health and the Oxford Centre for Triple Value Healthcare. So it's important to distinguish between two similar sound and quite different concepts, equality and equity. The former implies equal share of something, the latter a fair or just distribution, which may or may not result in equal shares. And uh, Thomas Rice is probably the most readable health economics book, I think. So uh, I, I think the important thing for the health service is to look at inequity. And that's starting to look as Lucy was saying, at a population approach. And I've just published something in the BMJ blog on called Population Geriatrics, and it's sorry, the British Geriatrics Society blog, saying that there, there should be in every geriatric department uh, at least one consultant in geriatric medicine with at least one uh, PA session a week with a map on their wall saying, well, why are we getting more referrals from the middle class parts of our population than from the poor parts of our population? And we've been working in a number of parts of the country, hip replacement in West Yorkshire, they found that people from the, the least deprived subsets of the population got four times as much hip replacement from the NHS as people from the least deprived population. That wasn't taking into account private sector as well. And I know when we set up a new cardiology service in Oxford, the referrals came from North Oxford and not from Blackburn Lees. 
So there's something I think, and I've discussed it with one or two people here with Paul and uh, with Chris and Lucy, there's something um, that we need to address uh, at the level of the population, whether that population is, and I, I'm fully in favour of the current um, uh, approach, the, um, this is my 27th reorganisation, but at least we've got words like integrated and partnership and network. Uh, and uh, I think the PCNs have got a good grip of this, actually. But I think it's at the level of the, the two other bigger population levels. We need to be our people with maps on the wall. And that might be provider of public health. And there's a good network of provider of public health people. But it's more a cultural issue of saying, well, yes, um, inequality and poverty undoubtedly are major determinants of health and well-being. But tackling them is a big issue. Um, and we have to be involved politically, obviously, but there's actually a hell of a lot we could do with a map on the wall, looking at re referrals to the dermatology service or referrals to, because almost certainly if I picked any of, of Paul's pa populations, I'd expect a fourfold difference in referral um, between, from different general practices, all of whom think they're doing the right thing. So, uh, so I think that's, um, I'll, I'll give you a minute back uh, and the, um, I'm going to reduce a, a fine of one day's pay for people who are confused about the terms inequality and inequity and fail to focus on inequity as something we can quickly do something about. That's great. Thank you, Muir. And very focused and very practical in that sort of sense as well, rather than entering some of those uh, broader debates, which are sometimes harder to gain traction on from, from the NHS perspective. Um, we've had a few questions in the chat box and I'll, um, I'll pick up some of those. But what I wanted to do just initially, and this is going to be tricky because it's because it's Zoom, because you can't take visual cues from each other, because you don't all know each other and work together all the time. You might end up talking across each other a little bit. But I did want to invite everyone on the panel just to ask, just to ask questions of, of one another. So was there anything that any of you heard in what the others were saying that attracted your attention, either because you, were, you seemed to be saying something similar or because perhaps there was, there was divergence in what you were saying? So can I, can I just open it out to the panel to ask each other questions? Here we go. That's it, you got your hand up first, Fazan. <laughs> yeah. oh, fantastic. May I just ask one to uh, uh, Mio? I mean, I've got so many for everyone, but Mio, uh, I, I'm loving this uh, concept of uh, inequity and equality. So I probably would have got fined until I came to this. Um, I, I, I know where you live. I know where you live. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and I, I think um, we've had a, a question that just popped up in the chat box. Uh, someone, Julia put a lovely question in saying, um, you know, uh, thinking about BAME is actually all about inequality quality rather than inequity um, and I guess my question was um, I, I, I'm struggling with it being you know health inequality such a massive topic is, is there anything you could do to help me as a GP and also as a system leader to, to think about really approaching that inequity but doing it in a focused like you know, pocket size way. So we could do a small bit that would make a difference for a focused cohort. Is 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 that how you will think it would be good to start rather than, um, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm concerned that that um, Chris said, you know, we've been doing this for years. And if we've been doing this for years, then why are we here in 2020? And am I going to be here in 2040 saying, I've been doing this for 20 years and I haven't made any difference because then I'll get my pension now. So what mm -hmm. advice would you give me to make a difference in that inequity? Well, I, I think you're pretty good at it practice by practice, that you're aware where people are, the deprived people live, and you're, and, but you're probably not aware of your referral patterns and how you compare with other similar practices. So I think it's just this awareness, and particularly difficult, I think, um, you know, I said to a GP once, what's your five-year objective? And they said, five o'clock this afternoon, that's my only bloody objective. I mean, you're really, you're so, you're so close to it that it's very difficult to have this sense of perspective. So, uh, but I do think the PCNs are doing good work and starting to look at this way. Uh, the bigger challenge, I think, Paul, is for the, uh, you know, we, in 1990, we cut the hospitals off from their populations, mm. uh, the Ken Clark reorganization. So I, I, most of my effort 
and our effort is going into thinking about the the ICP or whatever they're going to call that that middle tier um, population to to deinstitutionalize the hospitals. I think is uh, what we've got to do. Thanks, Fazana Muir. I mean, I just want to also. I mean, Chris didn't say Fazana, but but a lot of the work that was uh, enacted to reduce health inequality under the period he was describing was successful. So it shows that these some of these problems are tractable and that we can we can actually move to action and we can actually do do something. Again, I just, I, anyone else on the panel? Can I ask anyone to else? That? Yeah, go on. Yeah, just right. I mean, you're, I'm really glad you said that because, as you say, it was effective and it was effective in areas that you could show you could predict that. that working well on that stuff would make a difference at a population level. And so we were able to show that, but it's a bit like vaccination. You don't just vaccinate a population and then say, oh, that's done. You've got to keep doing it. And that's the same with this, this topic. You've got to keep doing it. And the circumstances change there. A big one, of course, was uh, the banking collapse and austerity. That came in and did a body blow to the work that had been achieved and, and so on. Then you get government change, then you get system change. All of those things, uh, they, we, there is a dependency to an extent on services and the way we're organised. Um, and so we can't just say, oh, that's right, we've done that. We've, we've done heart disease. What do we do next? We've still got a problem with heart disease and we've got to speak, keep using the methods that, that uh, we think work. I think that, that was where sustainability came and uh, I sort of chucked it for sensitivity because I know you've got to keep it reinventing it rather than just sustaining it. Can I just make another point out while I've got the floor as it were about, um, about the information systems um, because I agree with a lot of what Lucy said about information and it's it's a, a lifeblood really for, for those of us are, are wanting to address the particular issues um, but two things I'd say about that that I, I over time I've learned one is it's not just about analysts it's about people who can interpret the results of the analysis and actually use it to translate to people so that it affects decisions that's the thing I find missing so much there's some wonderful you know from when I was working in the, in the end of the 2000s we'd have we, you know, we'd have cut our arms off to get some of the data that we've got now, but it's still not having its impact because it's not being interpreted for people. And some of the is so complicated. So I'm afraid some of the PHM stuff, I look at it and think, oh, God, what does that mean? Um, so, so that's an important thing. And then the second thing is to actually moderate data with insight. And that's a question of not just it's softer intelligence, it's qualitative intelligence. And it involves going down and talking to the people who have got the problem. Uh, and, and also for frontline staff who actually have got so much more understanding of what the real issues are than we can actually derive from the data. So it's not an either or, I think it's a both end. Um, but I think some of those things are actually missing. Uh, in uh, play. Chris, that that's great. And I, and I think there are some, I mean, sometimes you hear uh, some of the more sort of committed advocates of some bits of the population health management agenda. And they, they sometimes seem to be describing a world, a world where AI and the algorithm will fix it. And all we need to do is identify these people, intervene with them, manipulate them in some way, and, and the world will be better. Nice corrective, though. It, these, these are people, you know, these are citizens and uh, with, with you know, with, with aims of their own and lives of their own. Lucy and Paul, I, just let me put this your way. I, I kind of can't resist doing that because the point Chris is making, it's all very well gathering all this data and intelligence and all the rest of it. Probably the limiting factor though is the use of that in decision-making. So I don't know if you want to respond to that because you guys are pretty advanced, aren't you, in the black country in terms of set, setting up your decision support units and the way that you're thinking about that. I'll, I'll let Lucy answer that first. So I think the point I was trying to make about kind of enhancing the role of analysts was about that kind of tripartite partnership between clinicians, analysts and policymakers. So it was about how you put people in a position where they can help interpret that data and help people understand that better. So I hope I was making a similar point to the one Chris was making. Um, and then the other thing which probably didn't say, but we are trying to focus on in the black country is how we collect more qualitative data. Um, so we're exploring approaches to kind of peer research and how we kind of use that as part of our kind of intelligence collecting as well. Um, and so I'm trying to embed in our programmes that bit about going out and talking to people. Um, so, for example, we did a PCN development programme last year and part of that 
the homework of some of our teams was to go and speak to some of those patients and even clinicians who are much closer to their patients were quite surprised um, between the difference of the assumptions they made before going and speaking to some of their target population and what they found out when they did speak to them so yeah I think it's really important not to make assumptions and to actually explore those things um, so I think Paul's got something to add to that but I had a question for Chris once once we've covered this bit <laughs> Well, no, go on, because I'll, I'll come in in a minute. I was, uh, there's something I want to kind of pick up on what Muir, Muir said, so you carry on, Lucy. So, so it's just, um, Chris, you said it quite quickly, but I think you said what remains of health and wellbeing boards. Um, and I think this is something we're, we're trying to explore about how we work more effectively with our health and wellbeing boards. Um, I just wondered whether you'd expand on what you were saying about when you said what remains of health and wellbeing boards and whether you think that's worth investing our effort in, and if it is. Any advice yeah. about how we go, go about that? I certainly will. I mean, health and wellbeing boards at one stage are actually described as the beating heart of local health and care. And uh, um, it, it, it had the potential uh, to do wonderful things. Um, it had the right people in the room, sort of, um, uh, and representatives and the right people in the room. And the kind of uh, leadership was able to be there. It didn't have extra levers. It wasn't given extra levers, but it actually brought people into a system where you could have common and uh, agreed agendas and you could bring the leadership to say, if we want that to happen, we can go away to our own parts and make that happen. So it was great. Um, it began to get itself sorted out. It was patchy, variable. Some are just talking shops. Some of them were doing really good things. But then we got the new kids on the block. We got the new arrangements, um, such as the old STPs and, and, and so on, where suddenly the same leaders were being pulled into those kind of agendas. But actually there was money there. And so people tended to leave the top table of health and wellbeing board, perhaps, and move over to uh, the other one where the money was. And then more recently, of course, it could have been the centre of place in the three parts, the three layer system, um, but with CCGs moving out of uh, their local areas and being brought together at a, a system level, who is the representative of the health service into health and wellbeing boards? And if that's going to be the core of a place based system, how does that work? We haven't worked that out yet. Nobody's been talking about health inequality leadership at place level, they've only been talking about organisations or system or PCN. So how are we going to re-establish or gather around again a health and wellbeing board version that actually can bring all those things together and make, because that's the level at which a lot of this stuff on health inequalities has really got the, the click. Yeah, Chris it's makes, a, Chris makes a really important point there. I'd like to come in on that actually, because this is something that we've been wrestling with as we've been um, uh, changing so I, I mean literally in my, in my system um, we're taking a recommendation to our four CCG governing bodies next week to merge our GPs voted to support the merger just this um, last week um, and um, but within that we had a long debate particularly with our GP membership but with also with our stakeholders about actually we it's not a case of either or we can't work at a system level at the expense of place um, place is where, and actually CTGs share a lot of strategy duties with councils. In, 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 our, um, in our system, um, we're one system, but we're, we're five places working with five different councils, so, and therefore five health and wellbeing boards. And one of the challenges that we face in terms of coming together at system level, actually, is we still need to maintain and actually encourage and develop and our relationships in place um, with local councils, we still need to be present at those five health and wellbeing boards. We still need to engage at that level because you're absolutely right. Actually, a lot of the shared partnership working across agencies happens at the level of place. It doesn't happen at the level of system. So um, I, I've been I've had the pleasure. Is that the right word? Maybe not. I've been through multiple mergers in my career in the NHS. And uh, one of the things that we're pretty determined to do, certainly in, the, in our patch, is not make the mistake of lurching from one level of working to another it's a, we need to be able to do both and we need to get the benefits of kind of system strategic planning whilst also um actively actually most of our engagement most of our work still needs to be at the level of place together with councils in the health and well-being board that's not uh, uh, but we're rest we've been wrestling with that quite a lot because it's actually it's a lot easier for people to just work at one level and so to to 
recognize that it's a case of both ands not either or and how do you actually realize it in practice is 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 uh, requires quite a lot of it's quite well i think it requires a lot of development relationship building you know constant engagement and work um paul i, well, I know you got a point for muir which i want yeah, to let you yeah. but i know but i just want to make what sounds like a sort of snide and slightly cynical point but it but it but it's not intended to be chris's point about sustainability of action if we were to look at the you know the the sort of layer of system which has mm. remained durable it's local government isn't it it's not the nhs that chops and changes yeah you're right okay. it's like every four minutes it's institutional well, setup four it's, years maybe four years, four years. Yeah, yeah. i think your <laughs> said he was always 29 for your but but it is but it is a constant swirl in the way that local government isn't and the citizen yeah. identification i'm a citizen of birmingham i was a citizen of chesterfield i'm not a citizen of BSOL, i don't think so the citizen identification is also with it's with place and it's with the council. You're absolutely right. And I think, therefore, it's really important for those that are working at a system level to recognise that and say, actually, in some respects, the system is subservient to place. You know, we need a model of subsidiarity, really, um, where we do. Um, so I do think system working is necessary because particularly within the health service, um, there's a lot of work that can be very successfully and helpfully done. And also, actually, uh, certainly in our um, system, uh, one of the fascinating things when you kind of when we when we talk to the health and well-being boards together is that there is more commonality in terms of levels of deprivation and inequality and and in the if you read out the four the, the sorry the five health and well-being board strategies for each of our places there's more commonality than there is difference in terms of the key issues that they're all tackling so actually there are opportunities for collaboration between places but the but public identity it's far more associated with, you know, place than system. Because you're right, system is an artificial construct, really, whereas uh, there's a permanency, particularly because of the endurance of councils, which I think people identify with. And I think you can't underestimate connectivity with the community in this as well, really. Yeah. Well, could I, if, I, mean, I, I don't want to hog the conversation, but could I kind of just pick up on yours, um, inequality versus inequity? Um, argument because um, I think it's pretty I mean, when I look at it it's very obvious to me that inequity for example of access leads to inequality of outcome and um, you know we have I, I can you know point to kind of you know analysis that we've done in our system which shows that um, the more more affluent households more affluent communities have higher rates of access for example to elective care and cancer services than uh, more deprived households and communities where which have much lower access but actually higher access rate um, to to emergency care and late diagnosis so you know it's it's palpably obvious that um, inequities in access are contributing to inequalities in outcome and part of our challenge I think is actually uh, we still need inequity of access but we need to reverse it the other way we need inequity of access to prioritise those communities and those households that need more support. And, and I think that's part of the challenge that we face is how do we actually, there's, it's not simply a case of equalising, it's a case of actually you need to revert, you know, you need to go beyond the kind of um, the extent to which we're at the situation we're at the moment. I think that's that's a, quite a sizable challenge, I think, to if we're, if we're really yeah. going to take this issue really seriously. Yeah, I think that the culture's got to be in the dermatology department or in the lab or in the spirited department, working of course with local primary care, but we've got to get um, uh, the clinicians to shift from quality to the patients treated to equity for the population served. Um, but, uh, so, uh, and, and I know Paul's team have done good work on this, but it's a cultural change in the clinical mindset. That's what we have to go for. Just, just on that, I do think one of the things that is going to help with that is this move towards um, ICPs, for example, a partnership yes. working in networks. Because one of the things that I think that does is it it brings the organisations together, including the local hospital, into a context of we're taking a shared responsibility for a population, and I, I think that does then encourage you to put the map up on the wall and say what is the what are the needs of our population rather than simply being um and this is a gross generalization forgive me but rather than simply being a kind of receiver of referrals which you, you then treat people you actually then become a 
uh, you actually relate to the entire population that you're serving and actually well, why is it that we're not receiving referrals and access from certain communities or certain practices compared to others so I do think the, the this business of bringing um, organizations together in networks in partnerships if it has a particular emphasis on taking a shared responsibility for a population and a shared responsibility for the outcomes for a population then I think that really will help to start address the points that Muir's raising I think. Fraser can I That's just quite, add to oh, this? Go on so, and um, then, but then I was wanting to come back to you on something else so go on. Okay sorry yeah so I've spoken to Muir about this before but Paul I think the solution to that is we need in each place to identify a consultant lead in each of our kind of key areas who have that session a week to think about population health because otherwise we just keep doing things reactively so you need to give people the space to be able to think about their populations and the support to be able to look at their referrals for example and where they come from and map those so that we can understand how that is, is distributed across our population. Oh, I think that's a good point. And I know certainly we're, we're doing a piece of work on access to specialised services and, and one of the findings I've heard Muir describe some of the findings elsewhere is, is about access being defined geographically rather than by need by population. So the closer you are, the more likely you are to access. I wanted to do one thing that Muir's, so Muir's teaching is all again, isn't he? Well, one thing that Muir has taught me uh, is, is to keep your boss's boss happy. And in the chat box, my boss's boss, as I asked um, al alongside Simon Harlan, the question about employment and about the NHS's role as a local employer and as an employer of local people to, to make sure that the NHS's institutions are rooted in, uh, in its communities. Um, Fazana, you touched on it. Lucy, you touched on it. I think Paul, you did too. I guess the question is what is to be done? You know, so how, how can we practically encourage things like uh, the employment of local communities in our uh, NHS institutions. I don't know who wants to have first crack at that. So, so Fraser, we, we've looked at this um, and it's early days, um, but we've, we've done a report looking at the wider determinants of healthy life expectancy with a big focus on employment. And actually quite a lot of the black country population do work in the black country, um, but we could probably do more. And quite a lot of the black country NHS staff live in the black country. I think it's more about um, the quality of that work um, and how you make sure your local population's got the opportunities to do the well-paid, high, high value jobs, as well as the kind of entry level jobs. So I think it's that kind of focus on those career pathways to allow people who are really intelligent but haven't had the opportunities to kind of progress and contribute in our, in our NHS. And I know certainly because we did a piece of analysis for you looking at that, the, the, high, the rates of pay were higher in the NHS relative to average employment, uh, relative to average uh, wages in the area. And the chances for progression, as you're describing, probably better, probably higher quality employment. But Fazani, you wanted to come in as well. I think I'd like to add to that that um, certainly I, I think. Uh, um, many of us, including me, until I'd spoken to, to Michael Wood, don't often think of um, the NHS as an employer. And again, the NHS is not a homogenous organisation. A hospital is a very different animal to 47 independent practices that we have in Newham. And actually primary care and GP partners like me are, you know, ideally placed because we're employers. I'm an employer, I run my own business. I have 10 people. And the, the double benefit of having local people is that it actually has a double whammy of improving health. So my reception manager lives two um, streets away from my practice. When she says to one of my patients, do you want to have your cervical smear, public health cytology? You know, we, we can't get people in talking about in, inequity. They trust her, they know her, she's one of the community. Um, we have that massive asset that we actually forget. And I think primary care has a great place here because we are local employers as well as trying to, to improve health. Um, I wanted to just um, butt in and talk about what Paul said. Um, I think primary care networks, I'm so excited about them because it's all about place. We cannot possibly make changes up at um, ICS level. Um, and um, I think that we're doing 
great in the long-term plan suggests that every ICS should have a clinical director on, but my concern is that we're all going a bit structural and organisational, and I, I don't know whether it's just me, but um, I find that the bigger you get, the um, the more kudos and the more you can have on your badge. So Fazan is national, so that's great, and then she's ICS. But actually that gets you further away from the patient and the thing that I love most is place level and we need more, we need a lot more levers to be able to work with local government which the PCN has started um, but we're still, um, we're still not there and that's because everybody has their individual budgets to look after and that's causing a, a, a real issue. So a good example is in Newham, our, our public health guys are just fantastic. We've got COVID champions, volunteers in the community who've gone above and beyond serving the community during COVID, not just the shielded crew, but we haven't done anything about that in primary care. We could have done a lot more joined up working. So we need to try and get rid of those silos. I know it's easier said than done. Try and think about shared working and, and maybe pulled budget actually. That's excellent. I, I mean, I knew I was going to enjoy this conversation because of the, the people in it, but the strong emphasis on localism, Paul mentioning subsidiarity early on, it's, it, this, is, this is tremendous, this is music to my ears. I don't know if there, I don't know if anyone else, uh, we've got about five minutes left of this discussion uh, across the panel. I don't know if anyone has any comments for one another. If not, there's a question in the chat box, which is about whether whether we all face sufficient incentives to address these challenges and let me let me put the cynical extension on that or, or whether we can just keep going on producing grand plans with no action associated <laughs> can i come in on that fraser because i think yeah, yeah. it's perfectly possible to carry on producing grand plans <laughs> um i mean this is i mean you know and the reason why i say that is because it, if i go back to one of the measures that i talked about earlier healthy life expectancy it's been getting worse every year for the last, you know, few decades in our in our system. Um, so, um, and the, the difficulty with it, really, to be honest, is because it's such a multi-agency agenda. It's actually you could argue it's no individual because it's no individual organisation's core responsibility. Then it becomes no one's responsibility and the reality is everyone's responsibility and it's a shared responsibility. But when you're having to share responsibility, I think you have to put the extra there's a lot more extra work that needs to go in to really kind of deliver on it. That's the reality. But um, uh, there are places that are really evidence that you can make a difference if you get the partnership working right. So, you know, we have to put more energy and effort into our partnership and our relationships and our joint working. And, and of course, um, and the, the, one of the reasons why I think place is so important in that is because of the permanency of and continuity that that offers you know, I've been through so many restructurings in the health service. Actually, that's counterproductive to relationship building and that that um, that continuity of development. Uh, just to give you a simple example of that, I think one of the one of the best um, examples of making a difference over the long term within my own organisation has been from our medicines management team because we've had the same people doing the same job, even though we've been through multiple restructurings. Same people doing the same job over to, over multiple years. And they took a particular focus on, on, um, on, um, on looking at kind of mortality in relation in relation to hypertension and the use of medication to support that. And we've we've gone over the course of fifteen years from being double the national average to twenty percent below the national average in terms of that. But that's because of that continuity of effort year after year after year and the continuous partnership working and evolution of that with with the GPs. Um, and it's that I think that's a real issue for us. You know, we need to um, uh, we need, uh, I think, continuity of, of purpose, continuity of relationships, continuity of effort. If we if we can make a different on the, difference on these issues. That's fantastic. I was really struck um, last week. I heard Anita Charles with the Health Foundation launch a centre in effect aiming at promoting long term thinking in, in health and care. One of the points she was making was that we we, the NHS, but also, you know, policymakers are much more attracted by the sort of shiny new thing than we are by doing the detail of what we know to be effective well and sustaining focus and effort on it. And yet that's one of the things I took from what Chris was saying. It's not as though we know nothing about what to do. We know plenty about what to do. We're just often not focused and durably focused in the way that you were describing, Paul, about actually doing something 
on that and being prepared to do the hard yards and the, and the detail of, of what to do. Um, we have a couple of minutes left. I don't know if anyone else on the panel has just any final uh, remarks before I thank everyone and, and bring us to a close. So does anyone, does anyone have any sort of concluding thoughts? Can I just say something, uh, joining up some of the stuff that we just heard about, with, and it, it pulls on incentives. And you know, in, the, uh, in the late 2000s, when we were looking at trying to get, we were going for straightforwardly cardiovascular disease, getting blood pressure controlled and cholesterol control, and whatever. And we got the Croft came in and it, 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 its maximum incentive was 70%. So the question was, oh, fine, but who's in the final 30%? We know who's in the final 30%. They're the people with all the complexity, the problems to get the change, the, the sustained, needing sustained support and all that sort of thing. But we incentivized it, the stop, as soon as it became most more difficult, as it were. And so there were places that we that came across that been challenged with that, actually came up with an exponential incentive where they basically said, all right, you get to 70%, you get this sort of level. But for each 5% beyond that, we'll give you a multiple of that rate and so that it gave you the resources and also the incentive to take it the extra mile the extra mile to those people who tend to miss out and i think it's a question of how do we build that into our desis and our uh, uh, and all those sort of changed things that pcns are going to have to do uh, and see if we can actually build in a way of saying no let's make sure that we don't stop when we get to the most difficult patients but we actually redouble our efforts. And it goes back to the inequity and inequality discussion that, that um, you fermented at the beginning. Now, and, and also Lucy's um, efficiency in um, uh, equality uh, trade-off that she was, she was making. Um, I, I, just want to, I just want to end really by, um, well, by thanking all of the participants, by thanking uh, Muir, Lucy, Fazana, Paul and Chris for uh, a brilliant discussion and, and helping to make sure that we ended the inequalities week of the festival um on such a high note really I, I thoroughly enjoyed that so thank you ever so much for uh for that and thank you for for doing your homework in in advance um i just want to to round out really um by saying that there are there are more events coming up uh, as part of the festival i think we're i think it, it, shortly at the end of today i think we grant we granted a day off and i think we get half term before returning um but later today there is particularly for analysts there's a, a sort of joint crossover event between the uh, analyst huddle that NHSEI have brought together and uh, the strategy unit in terms of this festival, illustrating one of the, the great developments, I think, under COVID of analysts working far more closely uh, together. Uh, later today, um, Rachel, you'll perhaps put around some details to, to other people, but we're interviewing Hashi uh, Mohammed, um, who's, uh, I think he was Radio 4's Book of the Week last week, uh, describing his journey from uh, being a refugee to this country to being uh, a top lawyer within it and then we we come back uh, at the start of the week commencing second of november and it's all themed around uh, decision making so we're going to have a whole series of events uh, about that but again much more of the detail and, and, and details on how to register are available uh, either using the url at the bottom of your screen or if you go to our uh, twitter account um, you'll find the find the details there um, but listen, thank you ever so much, everyone. Thank you so much for our participants. Uh, and thank you for everyone uh, attending. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.